Okay, so you know we have uh, selected this photograph, though it's a very, very cliché photograph, but it's also India's most recognized monument, the uh, Taj, as we all know, and we all know about its beauty, and we also exactly what it is and how it also helps in the structure of the building is something we'd like to show you. Uh, so, what are the materials? Hello? Yes, madam. It's okay? Okay. Okay. What are the materials? We'd like to go into the details as to what are the materials that are used in the making of the patch. Um, so, there's lime, as you can see, but lime, not as we know lime today, which is a factory, mostly factory made. But this is uh, this was made on site with bone, bale fruit water, fine surki, and coarse sand. These were all, all mixed and churned for many months to bring the consistency and the shine. That and then it was applied over and polished the walls, the very beautiful walls in the central hall and the half octagon. And uh, you will see how intricately they have been carved. The stone has been carved, and uh, how many patterns and links and circles of the walls or the curved part of the curved ceiling. And it's called a diamond cut. And maybe you can see the red. Uh, you know the red sections that have been marked in red. This is where these are. So, and the mosques have walls of the mosque and the Mehman Khana, and they they this is a special technique of coating of red plaster is applied over the white one. And then the top coat is cut away to expose the desired design in the white layer underneath. So this is not really painting, you know. This is more like a carving. To, to you apply two coats and then you scrape one in a pattern to expose the one that is under it. And of course, there's much, much, much stonework. There's the jali, there's high relief stone carving, then the, the columns which are which being a traditional building crafts also are necessary for the building for its st uh, structural um, stability and its strength. And then there's wall ornament designs and then there's different very beautiful actually people forget to notice the flooring, chameli flooring. Uh, this is a bit uh, technical as to how the building was built and the bonding between the stone elements okay now we are sure we've also shown you the modern flooring in the southern side and this was then carefully removed to find out the nature of the original flooring in 2004 and 5 which brought to light the brick on edge flooring all over actually this is a very favorite flooring of mine it's very practical it's very sturdy it's very easy to do and it has a nice pattern so and then of course Everybody knows about the inlay work and the vitra dura of marble, which is the Taj is covered in it. And these are what we have, uh, what people have researched. These are the, besides the semi-precious stones, all the natural material that was available on and in and around Agra has been used. So sugar cane, honey, lemon juice, marble dust. You see, they collected so much marble dust in the building. While they were building it, when they were cutting the stones, and there was so there was a this was a very good, good economical way of using this. So and this is also this kind of uh, uh, lime plastering and other treatment surfaces. It's it was it is still so effective against termite. You know the Taj has no termite. It just hasn't had any termite. So these were all traditional knowledge based skills. It was not just to decorate, it was also to protect the building. 
this is a vast you know knowledge that uh, still craft people have only thing is we don't tap it what we are going to do mostly is cement use kar lo you know because it's very strong but they don't realize that cement and stone don't go together in fact it's the worst thing that you could do and every government building and every private building it's become so hot you can't sit you need air conditioning all our traditional buildings no need i go to jaisalmer all the time even in may and june i sit in a haveli or a small part of a small home there just no need for anything so there's a major range of craft people involved if you i mean you can see that i can read it out also there's a, and they have traditional names and they have the respect according according to them like these days we have a junior engineer engineer senior engineer project in charge all these people had their place a uh, place in society place on site they were given the respect and uh, we are losing this we are just think of them as labor now mostly uh, okay some is semi trained labor otherwise it's trained labor that's it so the we forgotten that what actually they are uh, you know none of us had engineers and architects when all these buildings were built they were all built by these people i'll go to my next slide so what are the indicators that a layman would look while defining traditional architecture or building crafts so does a building does it have vernacular architecture is it local climate responsive material does it have any traditional ornamental and detailing does it have a heritage value does it have a cultural significance does it have a religious significance all these things only then would you say it's a building that is a traditional building um, architecture uh this is a slide just to show you the vast plethora of heritage buildings and styles and techniques that we have all over india being lost now i believe in some i would i wouldn't like to name but i believe that even some very very expert agencies and bodies are using cement cast cement blocks instead of stone carved blocks where they are um, uh, repairing they are using artificial color thinking that that's making it brighter they don't they uh, we are losing the knowledge that if we use these chemical paints we are actually corroding the stone and we are actually ruining the building anyway what uh, what we do have still is uh, this amazing repertoire of stone carvers wood carvers masons they work uh, some people call them some temples call them but they do, they are not getting any major works during the times not that they were a best time for all of us but during the pre independence we we had major patrons in the maharajas or the nobility who gave work to thousands of crafts craft people however that you know yeah let's go to this slide i mean this is a marvel and this is one marvel which everybody knows in gujarat but you know step wells all over india in, in places like haryana uh, everywhere i mean Uh, if the architecture itself is to be admired the way they stored water what uh, we are talking all the time this time of you know natural resources and all preserving but these people we all did it it, it was part of our life we never wasted a drop of water these are decorative of course very beautiful but a whole range of architectural crafts that you can see around you and you know so these old doors and everything now it's not just that the doors are carved for beauty but these studs that are put in these studs are made are put in so that the door becomes heavy and it's not opened easily it becomes a security measure also it's beautification is one thing but the whole technique in making carving and installing this door it's for an it's actually another story it's not just beauty 
Arash, we are still we are trying to revive, and some people have started using Arash. It's, um, you don't need a marble facade, and Arash facade works as well. And um, this is stucco in line. This is not stone wall. This is actually then red oxide flooring. It's basically done in the south and in Goa, and it was done, you know, uh, with the local material available there, including coconut, coconut husk, things that bound it together. But you know, this craft, this tradition of building crafts is actually, I couldn't, I was trying to find for some specific project, five craft people who could do original, authentic red oxide for I, I couldn't find them 10 years back. Then there has been some training and we have got some now. Uh, tile making, metal work, wrought iron, patching. Yeah. Uh, actually, I did this. Uh, this uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 family property of mine in Husharpur in Punjab. And um, every year, I remember growing up this is our place that we had. And the village women and men would come and they would thatch and they would also apply gober and lime. Of course, inside now it's all changed and because it got all changed and I was telling my, because they put the modern flooring and they, they didn't, you can't treat this and this. Now we have to, after every five years, we have to find some people who can come and do this thatching. And this bangla, I grew up here and in the heat of the Punjab summer, no fans, nothing. We slept under it, we played under it. There was nothing, we didn't need anything. You take these pots, gharas, and you place them ulta, and then you line a coat of lime, and they keep the building very, very cool. Very cool. And this I have shown you already, but these are these these crafts came to us from Persia, and then lime frescoes all over the palaces you see, and even in some homes. And the havelis, the Shekhavati havelis are full of these beautiful uh, paintings done over lime plastering. Stained glass, actually, I don't think is a traditional, you know, coming down the ages, but we adopted it when the Mughals came. We adopted so many traditions, building traditions. This is one. This, uh, I mean, it has a certain beauty. It also has um, kind of privacy, it brings privacy and light into a. I'll, I'll now talk about um, some case studies where we worked extensively. Chanderi, as you know, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, and Chanderi is actually very famous for its fabric, for uh, the Chanderi fabric. But Chanderi has a, a very well preserved vernacular architecture uh, tradition of the homes of the weavers. And uh, they are built in a certain manner, and so are many weaver homes uh, across India, but uh, most of them have been destroyed and sometimes even our governments have helped to do that because they are for um, weavers where they go and weave like a nine to five job so they've stopped weaving in their homes and this has had such a major impact on the social fabric of the people anyway we'll uh, this generally we did a lot of work and we benefited 200 weavers and not only we so when we realized that the weaver's home was suffering and people wanted to, and it's aspirational and it's just perfectly understandable to have aspirations and why would anybody want to live in a kacha home when they can see the rest of the people living in a cement home. But we did something, I'm going to show you what we did. So we identified the broad weaving clusters within a town. And then we also identified the traditional microclusters within these. And we determined the key features of the traditional vernacular architecture. And then 
it was a difficult process it always is as you can understand he had to try and convince them that we will no we just go back we will spend money and we will bring make their homes some things that they can live in that are aspirational will uh, this thing their modern needs but will also give them all the advantages that their traditional homes had so then we had we did a documentation and we we managed to actually in the beginning convince only two householders two weavers uh, out of 40 that we had identified who said okay we you know we give you our homes and you can work on them so this was how um, we went about it we handled them now what are what were the major issues they so in their traditional homes we identified that there was water leakage there was damp dampness inadequate space since the increase in family members extreme temperature variation i think uh, temperature variations have also come back, come out more because of now the environment and all that then also this non availability of the materials their local myer board was not available then now all crafts people weavers are being managed by middlemen and very low wages so they have no no way of uh, improving their homes and of course this is prevailing all over india and it prevails not only i would say in the, this class but even among the it's uh, it's more it's stronger it will last more uh then then a kacha house or even a house made with stone so and it is expensive to maintain so these perceptions this is just the clusters that we had identified and we identified where all there is modern where there is modern vernacular and where the clusters that are totally traditional and of course as you can understand the totally traditional clusters were the poorest people the poorest ones so this is a typology of a weaver's home in chandeli okay so because you know they they uh, they weave sarees so they need that span so even the humblest home had that span that space inside it to be able to weave sarees and sit on both ends and these are the um, how are the so broken pottery uh, the wood myer support for the loom the wood for the loom all this is needed how to weight it and the stones that uh, provide the the outer the space this is uh, how it's flow it flows the air the ventilation and you know they have they have special needs we were so they start weaving at a particular time of the day and the sunlight should come they are made madam we are facing lot of uh, so noise the, the sunlight is going that's it it's not going to move there should be no sorry we are facing lot of uh, noise sound breakage from your side we were not like able to hear it was lot of breakage oh lot of yeah um, i think you have a internet oh, issue your side maybe there's a problem with the internet which is coming and going i'll come closer to the speaker is that better yes you can try we can try okay i'm coming very close to my laptop yeah so that at least we can is that better uh, yes madam it is better now 
Okay, thank you. Shall I continue then? Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. No. But you could see my diagrams and get the gist of it. I hope. Yes, the slides are visible. Oh, so sorry. Anyway, tomorrow. Let's go on to the next slide. So uh, there's, I was telling you, there's a regular airflow and temperature control in these buildings, which is most needed when you're working with threads, uh, especially silk. You need a very good humidity control. And the fine twisted yarn is because it tends to break easily. And temperature differences can affect the tension of the yarn on the loom, providing uneven. So there, these homes have all been built with that in mind. But our pakka homes that are being built by the government don't take these things into consideration. They're all standardized forms of building, right? So, and then also this uh, flow, as you can see, of air and the, the locally co quarried chinkari stone that which keeps uh, extreme heat and cold at bay. And over these white stone exterior, they apply a lime wash. And uh, that is very, very important because then the, the reflection of the sun, the light. And uh, the wooden truss roof constructed with wooden beams overlaid with small twigs and thatch. And then on top are the stone slabs or patties, patur they are called. And there, there's a beautiful facilitation of airflow and breathing and light in these homes. Very simple, very, very like jugis you would call them, you know, really. This is the interior. And you can see the damage. You can see um, but you can also see, uh, you know, the, the, the slats for the ventilation, the very large windows, opposite sides, and the long span to be able to weave a sari, which you know is five and a half meters, but they need half a meter here and half a meter there, at least for the weavers to sit. And then, of course, soft floors are very, very important for this because, um, you, uh, the, the, you know, there's a movement of the loom. And it's that movement that creates the weave, helps in creating that weave. Now, very hard pakka stone, the, the loom doesn't move properly. And it's, it takes hard, double the effort for the weaver. Okay, then there's sitting, uh, setting up of pit looms and posts that are required, then handling small delicate pieces of loom accessories, and uh, uh, of course against bugs and termite, uh, which can ruin organic yarn, as you know. So this lime coating, lime plaster, soft floors, it's all, it's all a very, very good way to uh, keep the, these bugs away and the termite away. And then it's not just about the home. It's also they go outside, you know, when they when they measure their uh, yarn, when they dye their yarn, it's all a community. It's all a community activity, and women are involved. And then they have traditional songs, and that's why courtyards are very important. And these they have these long, narrow, cobbled lanes where they all stand and do all these things. All that is going when we are building them these blocks of apartments. When we are building these new modern architecture apartments, and then they go to karkhanas to weave. Anyway, this is what is happening all over India, mostly. So we took up these homes, and then we started. One of our main things in restoring reusing or repurposing old buildings is that we try and use 70% of the old material available. So we, we have a very, very, um, and that's also a craft and an art to be able to sort out this reusable material and to keep the things that we need and then reuse them. And even in these homes, the two homes that we, we 60 to 70% of these broken homes, we, we were able to reuse this material. I'll show you two homes. Uh, and this is the process in which, OK, so now they wanted a pakka floor. Anyway, we found this. We, we said, OK, pakka floor, but with the stone that is available, 
because that's a breathable a soft stone. So we use these for our tiling. Then we again did the wooden layout and we used the stone uh, slabs. Instead of uh, thatching, we did, we did, so we did try and incorporate some aspirational objectives. But we did use at the bottom, under that, we did use the reeds to cover the truss. And then we involved the women to make the mud plaster. And then we did the mud plastering also. And on the floors as well as on the walls. And so this is it. Before and after. Uh, and we gave them small, well, I'll talk to you. This is before one and this is after. And you can see that the roof looks traditional and has some of those qualities also. However, it will not leak anymore. And then these alas or shelves that they require for their small tools or their household, we, we, we made those properly. Ma'am, you have not shared your PPT. Ji? Ma'am, please share your PPT. Please re again present now. Uh, well, uh, the, the PPT is visible. Uh, the PPT is visible. Please uh, check at your end. Yeah, it's visible at our end. Yes, yes. Madam, you we, can... uh, let me, let, please, let let me redo it. Please okay, please. now, now, uh, we'll, 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 I'll show you the slides again. Yes. Okay? Ma'am, it's visible. I think one slide may not have been, but one participant is not able to see. The rest, everyone is able to see. Oh, oh, the, uh, the, so Vikas, my colleague is saying only one participant cannot see, the rest have been able to see. Anyway, what I'm going to do, uh, Dr. Vinayak, I will share this with you later. Okay, madam, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about it. And uh, anybody, you know, can contact us anytime. Okay, so I just want to go through, uh, because I think we have to get over and I have lots to show you. So I should quickly go through these things. These are before and after restoration. After these two, uh, weavers were got what they got. Uh, we then got many requests, but of course we don't have the money to make all the homes now because we did it out of our own uh, okay and then I wanted to tell you that we also made toilets for them shared toilets and uh, you know these homes have these um, we found that the same patterns in their decoration as if they make in their <laughs> saris so the famous booties and all that even the most humble homes they have these very beautiful uh, gateways or something where they have the carving of the traditional sari weaving techniques also. Okay, now Jaisalmer has been a very, very long, very long 20 years we have worked in Jaisalmer. And it's a very, very long, I think, presentation. So, so I won't talk much because then we want to show you a film also. And um, I'll very quickly go through this. and. Uh, as I said, you can always contact me if you need further information. So this is all that we did. I will quickly go through this. Because once I get involved in my talk, I will also, also forget <laughs> time. Okay, so just on my fort, my, many of you may have been. It had many problems. It was actually on the... It's, all, it's still maybe on the verge of collapsing and the problem is modern. The problem is not old. It's not because how the buildings were built. Now, every household in Jaisalmer has water on, on call, tap water. Of course, a need. But then there's no systems for the drainage. So they, they get free water and lots and lots of water. And many of these homes are now uh, guest houses. And uh, the water just goes down into the hill. And it's 
damaging these buildings, beautiful palaces, collapsing bastions. So the, actually the number of licensed hotels may be seven or eight, <laughs> but out of the number of residences, now there are more, more than 384, there are 425 or something. I think about 380 of them are hotels. Anyway, we took these many, many projects and we have worked extensively to restore the Jessamere Fort. Ranika Mel before and after using traditional building crafts and techniques only no cement Pe using people from there training them both to make cement to, to do the wood carving that technique is still there and quite high I have to say but still we also we also strongly feel that unless our work architectural restoration works helps the community it is of no significance and it should be sustainable and it should be long term. It shouldn't be that we are doing a project and when we leave, it's all back and nobody benefits. So these many things we did. We also did the Hava Pro through which everyone enters with the main square and it's three meters. And it's very crucial for that you can see the cracks, water, you can see the watermarks. You can see how that was damaging. And it still is because that was not something Inter can do. That is a government thing. Many, many schemes have been made and much money has been spent. Let's hope to work into the building crafts that have gone to make it both structurally and ornamentation. Significance of a jali, a huge significance. And today, I think even more now that I, me and Vikas are sitting, we've opened two or three windows. Vikas, just open a little bit of the door. I'm talking without a mask. Actually, I should wear a mask. Uh, the jali, not only is it beautiful, look at the light it provides, the wind, the ventilation, and the privacy. It was damaged during the... 2001 earthquake before and after work done by us and these very quickly what all we did another mehel quickly all these elements that we have we found on site being reused have been reused replicated restored reused this modi you know was traditionally a path for the security for the guards and all to go around it became an open toilet, open toilet, uh, open garbage dump. Because they didn't have toilets, we provided before the Swachh Bharat program came into being. In 2001, we gave 250 toilets to every household in the in the fort. So much so, I had I was called to <laughs> toilet didi. And people used to come to me and say, Ki aap ye 20, People used to say, aap hume de dije. Somebody would say, Ek naya room bana dije. Somebody would say, hume to andar nahi jana hai, hume to bahari jana hai. But we persevered. And what I always felt was that, okay, these older people may not change their habits, but the young people will. And that's what has happened. Now nobody goes, hardly anybody goes to this. They all use their toilets. Small toilets we gave, but yeah. Okay, they have this beautiful stone carving tradition. It's beautiful as anywhere or even more. And it's a Jesselmade. Parts of it is like an open museum. So we wanted to help these craftspeople, these stone carvers. So we got government funding and we set up a common facility center which is being used till day by more than 200 craftspeople. So this is the impact that we have had. We did listing of all the heritage buildings. And we're going to now show you a short film.
onca sınır. Um, we cannot hear anything. Is there any sound associated with this document? Even I am uh, waiting for them to respond. Their participants. I know. I know. Hmm. We are going to try and fix the sound. We are obviously not very techno savvy here. Uh, Vikas will go and bring them. We, when we checked it, it was fine. Yes, it is now. You can hear it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. perfect. Ma'am, only the voice has to be increased. Volume has to be increased. The story of Jezebel is an intricate and intriguing web of fact and legend, of truth and law, and many a time it is impossible to clearly separate the two. It pulls at your heartstrings, beckons you, seduces you, making you want to go there again and again. The gold bar sandstone of Jezebel is widely used for all construction work inside the fort as well as in the city. From the majestic palaces, mansions and temples to the humble abodes, each one stands out with a unique piece of art, a wash with a patina of history and tradition. The entire city is like a sculpture in the golden yellow stone that emerges out of the landscape. Its dark contours bathe with an air of romance. The stone is sold from the general stone mines of Jaipai, Simla, and Mursaga all in the vicinity of Chesapeake. Mining the stone is a laborious process requiring both skill and strength. A row of holes is drilled and iron wedges are stuck into it till the block breaks down and all the lines are clean.
The true beauty of Jessel Bear lies in the richness of its stone carvings and ornamentation, exhibiting a plethora of floral patterns intermingled with innumerable geometric motifs. This creative precision brings a nuance in the trap and vines of the desert city. The exquisitely carved facades and intricately patterned screens serve to diffuse the harsh desert sunlight while allowing fresh air to enter. They also enable women of the household to observe the happenings of the street unobtrusively. The abundance of the stone and skilled craftsmanship in Jessenmeer allows extensive use of carved stone to be used in construction, even today. In spite of the slow but steady intrusion of modern values, Jessenmeer has clung tenaciously to its traditions and customs. This is the strength of Jessenmeer, where a unique bonding of the new with the old may be witnessed, where the past is not only the past, but also the present. Jessenmeer truly remains a mystery in stone and sand that is teased by the spirits of the past. artisans have a strong urge to carve their own market niche. The major constraints in their development are lack of new design elements, poor exposure to market demand, and ineffective infrastructure at the grassroots level. Sensing a need for intervention, Intact established the Common Facility Centre in the nearby village of Ramkunda with assistance from the Development Commissioner, Handy Crafts, Government of India. This stone workshop is equipped with hand operated machine tools that increase the efficiency of the art. The use of lathe machines has revealed stones hitherto unexploited, rich, deep texture, and enlarged the range of products. Facilities used and operated by artisans of various communities. With Intact's design interventions, a new range of utility products has been developed. The artisans of Chesson Bay play with simple forms and aesthetic shapes to create a symphony in stone, the Golden Symphony. There are 
famous Bhopal Begums of Bhopal <laughs> in 1819 and this um, was restored and it's now being used as a craft center and especially to show the case the local crafts and cuisine of that region and these were the project highlights again only using we only use local building techniques and we, we would this talk especially to emphasize to all you young people and people in the field that really when you do your projects and you take up whether it's in government bodies or individually in organizations do always remember our traditional building crafts and techniques this is a map i think uh, we have only 15 minutes so i'll quickly go through this um this is before and after so the kitchen and of course local crafts and people you know we are used and we do a lot of training while we are doing on site work we are doing a lot of training we emphasize on training the local people and of course architects young architects interested people engineers anybody we have a whole division called the uh, intact heritage academy and we are uh, we, we do our courses inauguration it's now vibrant well these days must be closed but and then just to give you a range that we also work in ladakh all over india and with the same philosophy very beautiful area of india again we did the mangyu you know monastery and you know we don't have any money of our own so we are actually uh, we get funding from many times now from the government as well you know the beautiful mandalas chortans very important to that region women were very very keen volunteers in this and, and several village youth and the very good thing is that they are carrying on you know they have started small businesses of their own and they now go all over ladakh with their uh, the skills that they acquired during our training and they are making and they are very very uh, the people there like i guess in bhutan but this is on their own no rule or regulation or law but they want to keep to their traditional building traditions in the region community participation is very important this was one uh, place in ladakh where the local king also picks up the rubble and also picks up the wood and helps when when there's work going on no distinction like that it's a very amazing situation in this region of our country this is before this the women working traditionally they never worked but with our kind of training and they got interested and they said we also want to do this local youth after restoration small small initiative but good impact social and financial economic impact is good environment of course is very good Okay, I think we are running out of time, but this is a very, very important aspect of our work, in which we are making the directory of the traditional building crafts of India, the first ever. And we have a long range of building crafts. Where I hope our list is here. Start, we should start. Yeah, but okay. Anyway, we can send it to you. 
and this directory is, is already available actually online and uh, for anybody who needs who would like this kind of knowledge and to know please and we also list all the crafts people we give their telephone numbers contact details so that anybody who wants to use their skills can contact them directly in that has no commercial interest in any of this or in any work that we do these have already been published published they are, they are with us in physical copies you can even go to amazon and buy them and more much many more are in the this pandemic slowed our work a little bit Work with rings. Directly, we, we also go back not only to the materials but the history whether the craft is indigenous, whether it came from some traveler or some uh, for the Mughals or whoever, Persian, Turkish, where, where the craft came, what how it's evolved over the time, the Sultanate period. Early Mughal brick buildings. And then British period, post independence, you all maybe some of you know of Laurie Baker and the buildings that were done in that time, this post independence. And then, of course, the tools, the regions, the, and then is, this is in Saurashtra. So, everything, like I said, cultural context, material tools, processes, artisans, everything is documented and it's put in the public domain. And you know, the more you go, I mean, we, we are doing like state-wise, then you have, can go to the city level, you can go to the village level. We are so blessed to have all this in our country. Metal embossing, another building grass. Sorry, it's got stuck like this. And just quickly, these are just processes that have been documented. Oh, sorry, it seems to have. Okay, we can um, till this set, set. If the, if there are any questions, should I take the questions now?